BBC Radio. Music News. Six music. Music News with Matt. So as we announced a few weeks ago, Robert Smith from The Cure is curating the 25th annual Meltdown Curating. Festival. Oh, very good. You know, I didn't even notice that. Curating. They missed a trick there. They did, didn't they? The Meltdown Festival at London's South Bank Centre. There have been some incredible curators in the past. Patti Smith, David Bowie, Yoko Ono, Nick Cave, Morrissey, Ornette Coleman, David Byrne, John Peel, Guy Garvey, we've all done it. Sure, Each guest sure, aren't they? is given free reign to stage their own cultural festival. Uh, music and arts and theatre and spoken word and installations and darts and film, anything they want. It all takes place at the South Bank Centre this year from the 15th to the 24th of June. We already know the lineup includes the Psychedelic Furs, Placebo, the Libertines, Manic Street Peaches, the Anchorist, Deftones, Nine Inch Nails, Mogwai, My Bloody Valentine, Kristen Hirsch. And some more acts have been announced today as well, including Death Cab for Cutie, Frightened Rabbit, God and an Astronaut, Low, Suzanne Vega, no. Emma Ruth Rundle, The Joy Formidable, Loop, Moon Duo, and many, many more acts. And a night billed as Curation mm. 25, which is a special show that features Robert himself. It's going to close the festival. Mm. And yesterday, I spoke to Robert Smith. This is a world exclusive, and he's a man who doesn't do many interviews. I think this might be his first in four or five years, I believe. And it was just brilliant to speak to him. We talked all about the 40th anniversary of The Cure, including his recollections of their first ever gig, their epic three-plus-hour live sets of recent years, whether they might play Glastonbury, the chances of new material, and, of course, the Meltdown lineup, putting together such an enormous collection of artists and the honour uh, of doing it. And just, just how do you tackle a project that vast? Here he is. When was your last interview? It's been a while, hasn't it? Um, I can't even remember, actually, the last time I did an interview. I, I kind of made a conscious decision a few years back that I would uh, just kind of step away from blathering. I think uh, we did some festival shows uh, a few years back, and, and I spent most of the time, it seemed like, wandering around backstage at festivals, talking to various people into microphones, and, and felt I'd probably said enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I've, I was, I've always, I've just been waiting until um, I felt there was something new and something that was worth talking about, really. And, and uh, this is the first time that I've actually felt compelled to, to do an interview. Because it's funny, because this like it, it sort of built up this whole sort of reclusive Scott Walkery sort of David Bowie aura around you of like, oh, he doesn't speak. He's such a reclusive. He's so mm. away from well, the public. I, I think in some ways it may be just a reaction to the fact that. Um, in the modern world, such as it is, people talk endlessly about nothing. So <laughs> I think it may just be a, you know, maybe a conscious reaction, maybe a subconscious reaction, just to not be part of, of that. So, uh, I, I, you know, I think that in the past, I mean, I've done a lot of interviews, and generally speaking, down the years, I, I would do, do interviews around a particular project, and, and there would be a focal point, and I would actually try and illuminate, you know, yeah. what was coming up or why I, why we were doing something, why I was doing something. Um it just kind of, you know, if you just continue to do interviews ad nauseum, you just end up talking about absolutely nothing. And <laughs> it, it, it just the whole notion of doing an interview becomes redundant. I mean, as it is, I've always struggled with doing interviews. That's, that's the weird part of it. Because when, when I'm talking about the band, you know, I, I find it a lot easier because it's, um, it's a collective effort and I kind of, I'm the spokesperson. But I've always found it very difficult to talk about myself in interviews and I and actually don't find it that interesting even as I'm talking. So... <laughs> So this privacy thing and trying to build up an aura, it's not really done on purpose. It's just that I, I don't have very much to, to say about you know, <laughs> what I'm doing if I'm not doing that much. I honestly think unless the, the band does something new, musically new, and releases something new, there's, there is little point in me talking about you know what we're doing next. So I did that for a while just to see if yeah. it might galvanise me in, in particular into doing something. If I promised we were doing something, that maybe it would. You know, it's like, I remember very early on in the <laughs> career of the band that the promote, unscrupulous promoters used to put the name of the band on posters, thinking it would force us to play in places <laughs> that we'd never even heard of. Um, it didn't work then, and unfortunately, it didn't work for me this time around. But, um, but funnily enough, doing this meltdown thing has I, I, um, actually galvanised me, in, and I've booked studio time for the band. So, if nothing else, um, then it's it's it's, it, I mean, it's worked in a way that I didn't think it would when I took it on.
In terms of the meltdown process, how does it start? Do you get summoned to the South Bank and sit on a velvet cushion and they present you with some scrolls and you get to choose? How does it work? Yeah, how did you know? <laughs> I mean, I've been aware of meltdown for a long, long time. I mean, probably the first time I was aware of it was when um, John Peel did it, I think, in, in the late 90s. And I've been to quite a few few show, meltdown shows over the years. I went memorably went to um, a Tricky played at Lee Scratch Perry's meltdown, and that that was a great night. Probably the most memorable for me was seeing Bowie in I think 2002. It would have been playing the Low album, and that was t- so inspiring. And in fact, it led me on to doing the tr- trilogy project, which I did with The Cure, which was doing three albums. We did um, Pornography, Disintegration, and Bloodflowers albums, and, and made a film of that. And it was actually that night watching Bowie which actually inspired me to think I could do something on, um, along those lines. So right. I've, I've always been aware of it. I kind of knew some of the people that worked there, and I just always thought it was, a, you know, it's, there's, it's a lovely set of venues, the South Bank. And I realised the 25th was coming up, and it just it just kind of happened, really. I just, you know, with me ending up being curator, I, I was very um, honoured, actually, to, to, uh, to take it on. I wasn't quite sure what I was taking on when I said yes, <laughs> but I thought, you know, how hard can that be? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is it. This is like, it's the most timeless pub conversation in the world. Is it right? Oh, what would be your festival lineup? Oh, what would be the best gig you could ever go and see? And you yeah, get... oh, it's kind of, I mean, it was, it's last, it was last November. Right. I think was when it, it, I just had sort of said yes and I'd agreed, you know, well, I can do, if I can do it in this way, this way, you know, I sort of thought if I can do it how I want to do it, I'll do it. But I don't really want to do it just be like the front man for someone else's choice of bands. But um, they said, yeah, go ahead, book who you want, do, do it how you want. So for me, getting the 10 main headliners at the Royal Festival Hall across the 10 nights of the festival, I thought if I can get that, I, the rest of it will hopefully just fall into place. Right. It kind of did. Um, <laughs> I really fall in the place, but um, with a lot of pushing and shoving. Um, so I drew together. I, I kind of put feeders out, and I this, you know, I mean, people just some people aren't around, some people aren't playing, some people are taking a year off, some people are playing their own shows, doing other tours, and obviously, every, you know, my dream festival. Unfortunately, some of the people are dead. <laughs> right. That makes uh, it hard. Yes, my shortlist. I kind of once I realised, you know, who would be around, who who I could ask, and that. I mean, it, there weren't that many people who I originally thought of that, that um, weren't around, and my original shortlist pretty much materialised. I was surprised at how immediately people said yes without really asking what it was, or you know, it's very heartwarming actually. The um, just to, to, to realise that a lot of people that I admired, you know, in turn, had, I mean, I know that with some of the people because obviously I know some of the people, but people that I'd, I've never met or spoken to it's really nice that they would just kind of say yeah it'd be great you know we'd love to be part of it i fenced myself in a little bit because i thought i'm gonna make the festival about alternative popular music i thought I'm, i can't start broadening it out to stuff that i listen to because i mean there's no classical music on that, that my meltdown festival there's no indigenous music there's no Katy bands there's no new orleans jazz bands there's you know there's there's no bagpipes there's, there's, <laughs> and I, I listen to you know a vast amount of different kinds of music so i thought to myself what I should do is listen to newer bands. I've listened to more new music in the last six months than I've probably in the last six years. That's great, though, yeah? Well, I think that's why it's, cat- it's kind of acted as a catalyst for me, because I've suddenly um, fallen in love with the idea of, of writing new songs. You know, it's, um, so it's had, a, yeah, it's had a really good effect to me. One of the organisers I was speaking to said that uh, she said that she believed that you wrote a letter. You actually wrote handwritten letters to all the people. Is that true? Because that's brilliant. Yes, I wrote, oh, that's so I wrote nice. to everyone that was invited. In fact, all artists I wrote to because I felt that um, if I was going to be invited, I'd like to get a letter from whoever invited me. I've, I was brought up properly. You see. <laughs> <laughs> Who on the list are you like? I'm going to ask him, but I don't think this is ever going to happen. Um, well, the only the only act that I asked, which was, which was tongue in cheek. I suppose, which is the very first act I asked because I thought, right, I'm going to aim very high. So I asked the Rolling Stones if they closed the festival. Um, and they politely declined because they said that they were playing their own shows in, uh, they were playing a show in Twickenham or something like that. So um, I said it would be, actually, when I realised that the date in Twickenham was the week before, I thought it was, I wrote back to them and said it would be a perfect warm up for you to do Meltdown, but they, um, I think they were doing other things. So it was very <laughs> nice of to reply, but. Um, uh, uh, I think I did it for a number of reasons. It's just I think I wanted to alert the meltdown organisation that I was aiming for, you know, possibly bigger bands than they might be otherwise used to in the Royal Festival Hall. So mm. once I got the Rolling Stones out of the way, uh, I settled down into a more into a more real world mode, and um, 
But yeah, there was hardly anyone. On the, there was only a handful of people that would otherwise have been on the list, the list and they were unavailable for genuine reasons. But, you know, I kind of had to juggle people, and but people were generally very um, understanding, I think, the, 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 the difficulty I was having. of, And obviously this is the first and probably last time I'm ever going to do something like this. So um, I think people kind of took a deep breath and, and tried to kind of help me along a little bit. The other big question is, are you going to perform? The last night, the, the Sunday night, is traditionally held for the curator. And I, it, it's a weird one because that last autumn I, I was talking to the others about how we're going to celebrate 40 years of the cure, which was happening this July, July 2018. And I said, well, we, should, you know, we should do something that weekend, the weekend, like the, the actual anniversary is the 9th of July. And I said, well, we'll do something on the Saturday or the Sunday, the 7th or the 8th, that, that'll be fine. And we went through a whole list of things, what, what what should we do? Go back to Crawley, where it all started, play in the pub where we did our first show as The Cure, um, or should we go mega and like, you know, play a show in every capital city in the world? And, <laughs> um, and we kind of... I, I sort of wanted to leave space, because I had a feeling that like, if we didn't do something new this year, we would never do anything new again, because it's the 40th anniversary of the first album in 2019. I thought, if I don't have something out new that year uh, that's it for me i mean i just don't think the cure will ever release another album so i thought i better leave some time in case i do feel like writing in case you do want to go in the studio so i thought maybe just one big show would be good um and then hyde park came up in that short gap meltdown had turned up and so right. i was in a bit of a bind because hyde park were like oh you know are you going to do anything else to celebrate? and i said well no at the moment i have no you know this will be it this this cure show at hyde park if i can pick the other bands that are on on that day this will be the day that we celebrate 40 years of the cure that sort of mutated into only show only european show for the cure you know and i thought oh god suddenly it was out there that it was our only show and which when i started to put meltdown together i thought hang on i've just i've just stitched myself <laughs> up a little bit here because i can't I, we can't play at meltdown i then thought in fairness to the people that bought tickets thinking it was our only show, it uh-huh. wouldn't be fair to put on another Cure show because that would seem wrong to me. See, so my, my sense of yeah. right and wrong would be kind of like, would be upset. So this, it's, 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 I decided to call it Curation 25, which is kind of recognising the 25th anniversary of Meltdown, but also the clue's kind of there in the name as to who's going to be on stage with me. Um, it will be me and four other people <laughs> that I know really well. Uh, <laughs> And but also some others, and we will be playing. It will be primarily the show will be drawn from Cure songs, I imagine. Um, but there will be interpretations of Cure songs, and there will be different different um, configurations of people on stage. To be honest, I haven't really um, kind of decided myself on how I'm going to do it. Um, but I know it will be based around me and and the, the rest of the band because. Um, for me, it's all part. The, the summer's all part of a, of a, a kind of a 40th anniversary vibe. So, it will allow me to explore some of the songs that we don't play a lot or or at all, and to kind of um, add in some different kind of instrumentation, that kind of thing, really. So, whatever it ends up being, it will be c- completely different to to um, the Hyde Park show, which is going to be a you know a celebratory cure show, celebrating 40 years of, of playing music. So that the meltdown thing. I think it's going to be a little bit more weird. Yeah. And more in keeping with the idea of it being, you know, the end of 10 days of the Meltdown Festival. So whether I'll rope in some other people who've been playing during the week, I, I don't know. I don't know who's going to hang around. I, I kind of know a couple of people that will be around and I might ask to join us on stage. So who knows? You know, it could be like a, a mass ensemble super group or it could just be me and a... And a banjo. Yeah. <laughs> So um, yeah, I mean, I you know, I'm I'm probably going to do something on my own on stage because I I don't really you know I've only done that a couple of times in my life and I don't particularly enjoy it, but I think this might be an opportunity for me to push past that, push through it, and maybe see if I can come up with a way of, of, of performing for a few minutes on my own. I always feel very lonely when I'm left on my own on really? stage. Really? So, so I was fine. when I look back at it, I'm always looking. Right, over to the wings, like motioning people, to, like, please join me on stage. I, I kind of have to be a bit clearer because people are going to be buying tickets this week. So I would imagine, that, like, don't go along expecting to see um, a super group. I imagine if you if you think it's going to be me and my four closest musical friends with some others on stage playing uh, some Cure songs, known and unknown, then you'll be buying a ticket for something. It'll be it'll be a good night anyway. Whatever we decide. And I'm sitting...
I mean, I was going to ask you about the 40th anniversary, but as to whether it kind of registers with you, but the way you're talking about it, you seem like it's generally proud, very fond of the whole idea of this, of marking it as, a, as an anniversary. Um, yeah, I kind of, it's a double-edged sword, really, because in some ways I hate this, is that the, um, the sort of legacy aspect of, of the band, because I don't really feel it, it is important. I mean, it's um, it's kind of there, but it doesn't really play any part in my day-to-day life. But I suppose it was just a way of recognising, you know, for everyone that's been involved and for all the people around us that it's been 40 years since we first went on stage as a cure. I mean, it was, it's it's been longer than that since we've been playing. And I mean, the band itself first played in 76, but um, but we dropped the Easy Cure name and became The Cure and went down to a three-piece in, in July the 9th. So I've still got the poster for it from the from the Rocket Pub in Crawley. I, I found it in a, in a in a box, which is quite <laughs> weird. I would have kept it. What do you remember from that show? Do you remember anything from it? Um, yeah, I've got it on tape. Actually, I'm going to release it. No way! It, it, it was recorded on, a, on, a, on an old cassette tape. They used to record everything from the side of the stage. It's a bit, <laughs> it's a bit uh, scratchy. <laughs> I don't know how else it's like. It's a bit grungy, but um, yeah, it's noisy and um, it's it's reasonably good. We that particular show because we'd um, we'd been a quartet for I don't know, over, over a year and and, and Paul Thompson who was the guitarist at the, at the time with us we it, it was getting rid of him and becoming a three piece so that we could be a bit more kind of lithe and a bit more punky um, we didn't need to have guitar solos you know I was getting it very sick of the tension that existed between me writing songs that were essentially kind of a, a kind of new music and and being held back by having to insert 16-bar guitar solos in everything that I wrote. Um, <laughs> so by getting rid of the lead guitarist, um, it allowed us to kind of become a, a much more contemporary-feeling trio, and that was our first night of, of, um, of that freedom. But we, we started the first part of the show with something called Morning the Departed, which was um, <laughs> so horribly pretentious, but we made this um, sort of elegiac music, and we... We dressed up as, uh, and we had a séance in the pub before the show, and um, it was all very tongue in cheek, but it was quite funny. It kind of set, it set the uh, set the scene for you know why we, for those who didn't understand what we were doing, why we suddenly dropped the easy and become the cure. Because there was a lot, of, there were a lot of locals who obviously like missed the guitar solos and were outraged that we were, you know, that we suddenly turned into this horrible sort of post punk band, but. Um, yeah, it was good, except I remember then it ended up in a fight, as those pub gigs usually did, but it was a good night. You mentioned new material, this, this sort of idea of being inspired by Meltdown and kind of this, this new music and kind of thinking about getting back into the studio. How far is that? Are we lyrics scribbled on the back of envelopes or are we demos or are we... Um, well, I've booked us time to do demos next hey, month. So, nice. <clears throat> so, yeah, by the time we come to do Meltdown High Park, we should... Uh, I mean, I'm in a dream world, I'll be playing a new song at, at, at both shows, but um, I won't tempt fate. But, yes, by uh, next month we'll be going in and seeing what we've got so everyone's getting their, their own particular demos together and I'm... Seeing, you know, I'm going over what I've been doing over the, the last few years. I mean, some of it's really good, some of it not so good. I don't know, really. I haven't really thought about it too much. I've, I've enjoyed, the last few years, I've just enjoyed playing with the band. I mean, I've just liked playing music. I think that there came a point where I think, like, unless, you know, I never wanted to be in, in a position where I was forcing myself to write. Right. Because I just, I never felt comfortable with it. I thought, I've found it very easy to write over the years. And it becomes more difficult, particularly lyrically, to come up with things that you feel genuinely, you know, like, I really need to sing this, I really need to say this. So it was that, really. I think we could have done three or four instrumental albums over the last decade, but um, I just didn't feel a genuine urge to do it. And I, I thought, well, the catalogue's good, the songs we've got to call in. I mean, that's why when we, we played a couple of years where we did the world tour, I think we, you know, we had a repertoire of more than 100 songs when we set off on the, on the first show. So... I wanted us to go around and play those hundred songs, you know, so no one would ever know what we were going to play when we got on stage. And I thought, well, what is the point of flogging a new album, on the, you know, if we've got all these songs that we never even play? So, um, so actually, I haven't really missed it. I think what, what Meltdown has done by listening to a lot of different kinds of new music and kind of becoming more aware, it's maybe reinvigorated my sense of creativity. I don't know. I just feel like I want to join in. I want to do something new. So, yeah, I hope it works. <laughs> 
I'd, I'd be happy if it does, but if it isn't, you know, if it doesn't, if the demos don't sound very good, then it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Talking about the long sets, you know, at Hyde Park, when Springsteen played, there was a curfew and they cut him off. So, I mean, it, d- it doesn't bode well. No, I was, well, <laughs> on the tickets and on the post and everything else, I've made it been a great pains to point out that we're playing for two hours because there's no way, I mean, they won't do anything other than just pull the power. So, there's not really much point. We may as well have a good end of the show within the time allowed us rather than <clears throat> be seven songs from the end and all the lights go out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it would be a. In some ways, <laughs> in character for us to celebrate 40 years of playing to do that, but um, probably not not a very satisfying way to, to do it. So, yeah, I mean, we're, we're already um, setting up shows that we're going to be playing next year, in 2019. So we are going to be playing, you know, so this isn't like a, a last show or anything. It's a, it's just a, the hard part of things is just a standalone, kind of a celebratory day because like the other bands that are on with us are all bands that I, like, that I love. So it's actually, the, it's a whole day really is designed. It's just like a, a hopefully be like a great day out. It's a, almost like a, um, an adjunct to Meltdown because obviously some, you know, there's some of the bands on, at Hyde Park I would have certainly invited to Meltdown if, if they weren't playing at Hyde Park, like Interpol and Ride and Goldfrapp. So yeah, I think it's going to be a, that would be a good day as well. You should do Glastonbury next year. I mean, come on, return to the scene. That'd be great. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I, we haven't had a happy history with Glastonbury over the years. Although we've headlined it three times, but we've never really been on the best of terms with them. <gasps> All I, the more reason to go back and do it properly. Yeah, it's a historic thing. I don't know. I don't know if they, if they um, forgive and forget, then we'll <laughs> see. But I, I don't know. They've always felt that there's, there's, there's been a slight problem there whenever we've... Um, considered it there's enough um you know other festivals for us to play i'm not you know we, we've already kind of like signed up to do some things and, and others but i think we'll end up pretty much going around the world again next year but probably playing a mixture of festivals and and our own shows and um and i think we'll be playing different kinds of shows next year i think we'll be recognizing various anniversaries of like the first album maybe disintegration i think is, is coming up for a big anniversary next year yeah and also if we obviously if we do end up doing something new then we'll be doing shows around something new which will be new (laughs) I'm just uh, at the moment I'm just excited by it all I hope it all works out I thought I'm old enough to know if it doesn't it doesn't really matter (laughs) what an absolute gentleman what a what a haiku Matt you should be very pleased with that one it was just really lovely to speak to him I mean you know it's 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 quite a good point don't do interviews for the sake of doing interviews do interviews when you've got something you're interested in and you want to talk about and Meltdown is that it's a brilliant lineup. southbankcentre.co.uk for information on that and it takes place from the 15th to the 24th of June it's just an amazing list of people playing from all across genres and yeah amazing to hear him talk about the fact they've booked some studio time yeah. to do some demos. Amazing to hear him talk about that very first Cure gig. On very, tape. And the fact that he's got a recording of it and he said he's going to release that, it. Who wouldn't want to hear that? That's you know, amazing, Also it? funny to hear the fact you tried to book the Rolling Stones and they said they were busy. <laughs> um, the whole interview, that whole thing is up online at the Six Music website right now. Um, it, thank you, Robert. Thanks yes. to the Meltdown people as well, obviously. But yeah, and um, we've got some more exciting Cure news for you <laughs> on Friday. That's all we can say. Right, well, if you're a, a Smith super fan and a Cure super fan, make sure you listen on Friday, which you will be anyway, I'm sure. Love that idea of I'm not having a seance in the pub before <laughs> that gig. <laughs> it's great. It's great. A lot of old moss gigs were a bit like wakes as well. Uh, absolutely marvellous. Excellent work all around. Thank you very much. In the Kate Moss hour, there is a distinct possibility, because of riding rush out of the breakfast format completely today, we've had 10 minutes of jazz, we've had 20 minutes of Robert Smith. Let's have a little bit of eminent physicist as well.